All right, I'd like to say hello to everyone who is listening today. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an associate editor for Horde Steryman Magazine. We welcome you to our monthly webinar series, which is co-hosted by Horde Steryman and the University of Illinois. Today, our webinar is titled CAF Management, Behavior, and Welfare. And our presenter is Emily Miller Cushion from the University of Florida. She is a first time speaker to our webinar series and we're very pleased to have her with us and have her talk about her work in the area of raising calves on dairy farms. This month's webinar is sponsored by Agriplastics and we thank them for their support of this program. Once again, I'll mention that if you are listening to the live presentation, you can click on the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel and print out the slides to take notes on or use for future reference. Also, if you have any questions that come up during the presentation, feel free to type them into the questions section and we will answer those at the end of the presentation. Our webinar team consists of Jim Baltz at the University of Illinois, our Horde Steryman Online Media Manager, Patty Hurchin, and then my co-host, Mike Hutchins, a professor emeritus from the University of Illinois. Mike, I'll pass the webinar on to you so you can further present our speaker. Well, very good, Abby, and it is my a pleasure to introduce a, a new face to our group here today, and that's Dr. Emily miller Cushion, and she is an assistant professor in the Department of Animal Sciences at the University of Florida. Uh, Dr. Emma miller Cushion grew up in Ontario and got all her degrees in the Canadian uh, system of schools up there. After graduating uh, from Guelph, she went immediately to the University of Florida and has successfully been very, very active over there. Her research program focuses on understanding behavioral development in dairy calves with the aim of refining or rearing practices to improve welfare. Uh, she has published, amazingly, 34 peer-reviewed papers and three book chapters, and in 2019, she received, received the International Society of, for Applied Ethology New Investigator Award. Dr. Miller is active in the, uh, uh, Dr. Miller Cushion is active in the teaching program, but both undergraduate and graduate levels there in livestock behavior. So, Emily, we appreciate you joining us here today, and the program is yours. Well, thank you very much, Abby and Mike, for the introduction. I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to participate in this webinar series. So this is a pretty broad topic in calf management, behavior, and welfare. But um, really what I'd like to do today is touch on some different aspects of calf behavior and behavioral development and discuss the, the welfare and performance implication of giving calves more to do, of giving them more opportunity to express different types of behavior. So we've seen some major changes in how dairy calves are reared across the industry. Um, although, you know, there is still a lot of variability between farms and regions. This is a photo from our calves at the University of Florida Dairy Research Unit. So at our farm, um, we have our calves group housed. So they have opportunity for social contact in their group pen. They're fed via a milk auto feeder, so this allows them to feed when they'd like um, and consume more milk than has often been conventionally provided. They also have a brush seen at the back right here to facilitate some grooming. And so what we've been doing in a lot of our research um, is providing calves resources to allow for um, the range of what we think they'd like to do. So the behavior we think they'd like to perform within the context of what's feasible on most commercial dairies. So this is the question we want to try to answer. So what uh, do calves want to do? So what calves do when we provide opportunity or resources for them to express a greater range of behavior? And then why or how it matters that calves are able to do certain things? So I wanted to start off with this question. So I can turn it back over to Mike to facilitate. Well, very good. Well, let's get active here and get ready to vote now. When not lying down, what do calves spend most of their time doing? Tricky question. The first one is consuming milk. Number two, consuming solid feed. Number three, non-nutrient oral behavior. Number four, grooming behavior. Number five, social interactions if group housed. Wow, Abby, the polls are open right now and uh, the answers are coming in rather aggressively. Abby, uh, do you have your favorite vote there? Yes, Mike. I would agree that there's not necessarily one answer that jumps out immediately. I 
my selection is going to be the social interaction if group housed. What are your thoughts, Mike? Yeah, I'm kind of torn between that one and the non-nutrient oral behavior. What I'm not quite sure. Maybe uh, Emily can define what that is for us, uh, uh, us Illinois folks, as far as that goes. Anyway, we've got uh, two thirds of the vote in. Jim, let's go ahead and close the poll, and you got to vote fast, vote early. Uh, Emily, what do you think? Okay, so this is actually pretty interesting. Um, so I guess first I want to say that I specified when they're not lying down because of course calves rest for most of the day, you know, 20 hours per day, but they're kind of like babies when they're awake, they're awake and they want to do something. Um, so this is a bit of a trick question because the answer is really, it depends um, on, you know, how, what and how much the calves are fed, what else they have to do in the pen. Um, I think it is interesting to see that social interaction of group housed was by far, um, the highest percentage and the answer is here. Often active social interaction is pretty brief, so a few minutes of active play and maybe social grooming, but calves do often rest socially. So we see a lot of social conduct when they are lying down, but maybe not quite as much as we might expect when they're active. Um, the next highest answer was non nutritive oral behavior. So I'm going to be showing some data that does suggest that calves do spend a lot of time doing this. Um, and then as far as feeding and grooming behavior, again, we'll, we'll talk about how some different factors influence how much time calves spend doing these things. They do spend more time grooming than people might expect, though. That, see, not many people chose that, so we'll see some data about it. Okay, so I'm going to start off this talk by talking about three main areas of social feeding uh, sort of social housing, um, feeding, and then other resources and how these things affect behavioral expression. So first I'll touch on social housing and the effects of social contact and some behavioral considerations for managing group housed calves. So there has been a lot of interest um, in the last little while in the effects of group housing in calves and a lot of the findings from this body of work mirror what we know in other species, um, including humans. So we know that early social contact is crucial for behavioral development um, and consequences of social isolation include development of abnormal behaviors, long-term differences in ability to cope with stressors, um, as well as neurological changes and cognitive impairments. In dairy calves, it's been fairly well studied um, in terms of short-term of short effects with studies following calves just beyond weaning. And we've seen broad benefits of social contact, including um, reducing fear and reactivity to novelty. There's also some evidence of long-term differences in social behavior, but there's been relatively less work examining broader long-term effects of early social housing. And this is something we're starting to look at in my lab. We also have evidence that social contact is important from the calf's perspective. So calves will work for access to another calf in tests of motivation. And when they're observed in the pen, they spend more time near familiar companions, so indicating social bonding, and they do prefer to feed socially. One question that comes up um, often is when to group calves, and, and this depends on what's feasible on different farms in terms of management. But generally, it seems like the earlier, the better in terms of behavioral development. I wanted to share uh, some recent data from my lab where we looked at effects of social contact during the first two weeks of age on later behavioral responses after grouping. So what we did in this study, um, at birth, we housed calves either in pairs or individually, and otherwise managed them identically in terms of feeding and so on. Calves were then mingled between treatments, so individually housed calves and pair housed calves were all group housed together on an auto feeder in groups of eight at two weeks of age. After two weeks in this group pen, we then looked at behavioral responses at four weeks of age. So we did this looking at some different behavioral tests, including an open field test, where we placed calves individually in an unfamiliar open pen and we exposed them to a novel object. So this was a large colorful ball. And we repeated the test with an unfamiliar calf present in the arena. So we wanted to see um, how calves were responding and behaving after this period of group housing. So we did see some effects of this social housing during the first two weeks of life on response to these tests. So calves housed in pairs prior to group housing in the auto feeder 
were quicker to contact the novel object, as seen on the left. They had this shorter latency to contact the novel object, and they spend more time in contact with the unfamiliar calf, as seen on the right. So these results are similar to um, some findings previously from different groups that have shown behavioral differences in individually or pair housed calves. But here we actually see a carryover effect where social housing um, during that first two weeks of life actually made a difference even after calves had been in group housing for a couple of weeks. So this suggests that even that brief early social experience might affect some longer term responses. So the effect of social contact and feeding behavior is, is a real benefit of social housing, but it does present some issues that need to be effectively managed. So it has been well shown that social contact early in life increases willingness to consume novel feed and stimulates uh, increased solid feed intake overall. Social contact has a, a lot of broad effects on behavior and learning, including eliciting behavior in other animals. Um, like if an animal sees another animal up at the feed bunk, they're more likely to approach and start eating. So this explains why we see a high degree of feeding synchrony, why animals are often likely to get up and go to the feed bunk together. And it's, it's been well shown that social contact encourages these early feeding behaviors in calves. So calves housed with social contact have more frequent meals. I mean, here's an example of some data where we see increased solid feed intake in pair housed calves shown in blue compared to individually housed calves shown in orange. So these pair housed calves, particularly later in the milk feeding period and during weaning, were consuming more solid feed compared to individually housed calves. And this also translated to improved weight gain through weaning. We also have some data to suggest that early social contact might have a, a longer term effect on preference for social feeding. So in this trial where we have calves individually or in pairs, we then paired all the calves within treatment after weaning and looked at preference for social feeding after weaning. So we looked at this uh, two weeks after weaning when the calves were 63 days of age. And to look at their, their preference for social feeding or preference to feed with their uh, pen mate, we set this up like a, a preference test in the home pen. So as shown in this picture, we put a partial barrier in the pen, and then we looked at each calf one at a time. So for this calf, this focal calf, they could choose to either feed next to their pen mate who was tethered for this test on one side, um, as you can see in the picture, or they could choose to feed by themselves. So we set this up in two ways. So first, we had, um, we offered the focal calf unlimited feeding places. So they're able to choose from their own bucket, either on the social side of the pen, beside their pen mate or alone. And then we had a variation where we removed the second bucket on the social side of the pen. So the focal calf was choosing between feeding alone or feeding with their pen mate from a single feed bucket in what was probably a competitive setting. So what we saw was that the number of feed buckets available on the social side of the pen actually didn't make a difference. Regardless, calves chose to feed alongside their pen mate more than half of the time. So they had this preference to feed with their pen mate that didn't, um, that didn't change when one of the feed buckets was removed. But we did see that calves reared in pairs, shown in, in blue in these graphs, were more likely to choose the social side. So they seemed to have more of a preference to feed alongside their pen mate. And this makes sense, you know, given what we know about the development of social bonds in calves, it makes sense that calves would choose um, to feed with their pen mate when they've been housed together since birth, as opposed to just grouped two weeks previously. But it does suggest that um, preference for social feeding and you know, social bonding might be increased in calves reared socially, which could mean we see them together at the feed bunk more for a longer period of time. So because calves want to feed together, because this is a common effect of social contact on feeding, competition can be a problem. And we do see that um, when we start to restrict the number of feeding spaces per calves, uh, we see increased rate of intake, longer wait times for access to the feeder, if they're, if they're using an auto feeder, and more frequent displacements for access to feeding spaces. And these behavioral responses to competition generally suggest that calves don't necessarily just adapt to different feeding schedules to avoid competitive interactions. It seems that they would still prefer to try to feed together. And there's also the potential for competition to reduce our feed intake, depending on, on the system. We have seen that um, milk intake can be affected by competition. Here's an example where we looked at pair-housed calves where we 
restricted the number of teats available to them. So we ha had pairs of cows with two teats available in what was supposed to be a relatively less competitive feeding scenario. And we had pairs of cows with only one teat provided. So they would have had to compete to feed at the same time. And milk supply was unlimited in this trial. So this graph is showing milk intake over the milk feeding period for pairs of cows provided two teats. So they were able to feed together. And in contrast, uh, here's the intake of pairs of calves provided a single teat, shown in orange. So in those early weeks of life, calves with a single teat consumed less milk and then kind of compensated by consuming more milk in the later weeks of the milk feeding stage. And we saw in this trial that the pairs with a single teat um, had way more frequent displacements of the teat, so they were displacing each other for a turn to feed. But the only a slightly less frequent um, they were only like at the teat together slightly less frequently. So they're still trying to get up and feed together at the same time. They were just more competitive when they were doing it. And this, when we see this shift in milk intake, it suggests that calves are um, affected by this competition more when they're younger. And this shift in milk intake towards later in the milk feeding period is probably a little bit of a problem because we already know that it's hard to wean calves from high milk allowances. And we don't really want to be shifting them towards a pattern of increased intake later in the milk feeding period. In this trial, uh, we did see some corresponding differences in average daily gain, where those competitively fed calves uh, gain less weight during the first weeks of life. We want to also think about how aspects of early management affect calves over time. And we've seen some longer term effects of early exposure to competition. So this graph is showing the frequency of displacements for feed in weaned paired calves that had been fed according to um, the, the treatments in the previous slide. So they were fed competitively with a single teat prior to weaning or non-competitively with two teats prior to weaning. But at the time of weaning, all pairs of calves were given two feed buckets as shown in the photo. But despite not having to compete for a feeding place post weaning, we saw that calves that had experienced competition for their milk prior to weaning were much more likely to displace their pen mate. So they'd got in the habit of displacing their pen mate for access to milk and that was a behavior that persisted. So this, this shows us the importance of considering how some of these early life experiences are going to influence the calf longer term. We're not just worried about how management affects the calf during those first weeks of life. So I think this consideration of competition and how it affects the calf raises the consideration that while we know social conduct is important, social dynamics in group housed animals can be complicated. So the welfare of animals and social groups might depend on their ability to express um, a range of social behavior. So we, we want opportunity for positive social interactions, but maybe animals also need to be able to avoid agonistic or competitive situations. Um, and we can modify the environment to reduce competition. Uh, for example, barriers preventing displacements are, are often used at different ages. Preference for social contact um, or for social proximity might also vary between individuals. And there's some recent work suggesting that it could depend on individual personality. And social preferences might also change over time. Um, for example, during parturition, dairy cows, cows choose to isolate themselves. In younger calves, preference for social withdrawal hasn't been explored as much, but we've been interested in how we can maybe accommodate different social preferences within groups. So we've been looking at what group house calves do when provided a barrier offering some visual and physical separation from other calves in the pen. So this is what that photo is showing where this was a space where the calf could enter. Um, it wasn't necessarily um, guaranteed to be alone. Other calves, calves could enter as well, but it did provide you know, some separation for the rest of the animals in the group, um, maybe an opportunity to avoid active social interactions and rest undisturbed. So here's some data showing how calves used this shelter, this space, and how much time they spent in it. So this was data from 24 calves that were each observed for three consecutive days. Um, and we did see that calves entered the space at least once a day, but there was a lot of individual variability and some variability over time as well. So um, for this observation, we saw that um, the minimum shelter use was about 10 minutes a day, and the maximum use was up to 20 hours, where a calf would just spend most of their time lying down inside the shelter. In this trial, we were also specifically interested in how calves 
might increase use of the shelter when in pain following the sputting. And we wanted to look at this because there's some evidence that animals in pain may alter their social behavior. Uh, for humans, for example, experiencing chronic pain uh, may exhibit social withdrawal. And we did see that disbudded calves actually increased use of this space, the shelter. Um, on the left, this graph is showing uh, that uh, calves spent more in time inside the shelter for three days following disbudding, showing orange, compared to calves that were handled only and not disbudded, shown in blue. So these were their pen mates just hadn't been disbudded. On the right, um, you can also see that those disbudded calves entered the shelter more frequently compared to uh, their pen mates who were handled only. So we did see that calves entered the shelter together sometimes. So, you know, again, shelter use was not exactly the same as social withdrawal, but we think this does suggest that individual calves might have some changing preferences for use of the pen space, um, and maybe they're changing preferences for active social interaction, um, and that these social preferences might be affected by states like pain. So this may suggest that providing um, more complex environments could accommodate some of these varied behaviors and provide us with some potential indicators of how the cat is feeling. Okay, so now I'd like to move on to some discussion of feeding management and behavior in calves. And I want to talk specifically about some aspects of milk feeding and hay provision. So this brings us to my second poll question, which addresses non nutritive oral behaviors. So things like cross-sucking and pen directed sucking, and I can hand it back over to Mike. Well, very good, uh, Emily. Uh, another great question here, and that is how, do, how can we reduce non nutritive oral behavior in calves? And you have to select one of these five options, only one. The first one is to feed more milk. Second, provide a teat for sucking and feeding responses. Uh, third, separate calves to prevent cross-sucking. Four, provide hay. And five, provide other items such as brushes, activity balls, and things like that. So the polls are open. We want you to get your voting here. We have lots of people who can vote here, so vote, vote quickly. We close off very quickly. Uh, Abby, do you have your preference? I would like to pick in all of the above because I think all of these could help, but based on presentations and research I've read about, I am going to pick the first option, feed more milk as kind of the foundation for preventing um, that non-nutritive oral behavior. What do you think, Mike? Wow, well, I'm gonna get rid of hay. I don't think hay sounds very exciting to me as, well, as far as that goes, but uh, I, I guess I would look at maybe provide other I items, you know, and the, the nipple almost falls into that category as well. So I'm torn if I provide a teat for sucking behavior and or provide other options. So with that, uh, Jim, let's close the polls. We got 70% uh, of the vote in and the answer, Emily, are interesting. They are interesting. And I mean, yeah, I think all of the above might have been the only completely correct answer, but I was curious to see what people would choose. Um, so certainly feeding more milk can help. Um, and I am I am maybe surprised to see that so many people chose provide other items. Um, we do have, I have some data I'll be talking about specifically um, looking at how brush access affected non nutritive oral behavior. Certainly teat feeding is also really important. Um, and Mike, hopefully we can convince you that providing hay is maybe a little bit more exciting than it sounds, but I'll talk about some of these. Okay, so I'll start off here with a topic that isn't new, um, milk feeding level. And it, it's pretty well understood that this milk feeding level has short and long-term effects as well on calf performance, where calves provided more milk have greater weight gain in early life. And then if they're weaned gradually, they can maintain greater body size, have better health, and have some improved reproductive outcomes. So in this graph, we're looking at an example of data showing milk intake at two ends of a spectrum. So we're comparing um, restricted allowance of five liters a day in orange, which is in line with about 10% of calf birth body weight. And in comparison here, we looked at providing free access to milk replacer where calves had a peak um, in intake around 16 liters per day before weaning, but they were actually consuming um, about 10 liters per day before they were even a week old. So these different milk allowances um, have some pretty dramatic effects on feeding time. So in this experiment, when we gave calves free access to milk, 
Um, we saw that they were feeding throughout the day, it's a line shown in blue. They had frequent meals, uh, about seven to eight meals per day, and they fed throughout the day, uh, although they had a peak in feeding time when fresh milk was delivered at 8 a.m. In comparison, calves provided the restricted milk allowance shown in orange, um, had only their two meals per day, and they weren't able to feed for the rest of the time. But we did look at the duration of time that restricted fed calves spent sucking on the teat after they had finished their milk allowance. So you know, unrewarded sucking time. And that's shown here in the dashed line. So this teat remained in the pen for the whole day outside of milk feeding. And those calves actually spent more time sucking on the empty teat than they did feeding. And then they also spent more time sucking on the teat overall than calves with free access to milk. So it really suggests that they are hungry and they're really motivated to suck um, outside of feeding. And we do know that uh, apart from milk feeding allowance, um, the actual action of sucking is really important. So non fruit sucking is also reduced by providing that uh, milk by a teat instead of by a bucket. So it's not just milk volume that matters, it's also feeding method and opportunity to suck. So I wanted to talk about weaning briefly because providing access to more milk is beneficial, but we have to be careful around weaning um, and give some consideration to how we're encouraging solid feed intake. We know that calves provided more milk consume less starter prior to weaning, um, which can delay rumen development and affect weight gain through weaning. So how do we ease this transition through weaning for calves provided more milk? So first, we need to have a long enough step down period. So about two to three weeks from peak intake uh, to encourage solid feed intake before milk is removed. Uh, and, and in the milk intake data I showed on the previous slide, we really didn't wean calves gradually enough on that trial. We gave them a seven day step down. And on that trial, we did see that those calves on the higher milk allowance kind of stopped gaining weight for that week of weaning. So they struggled a little bit. Weaning calves later can also help. Um, example here, of weaning calves at eight weeks of life versus six weeks of life helps them performance through weaning because calves are consuming more starter intake the older they get. So it's easier to wait a little bit longer before you start trying to wean them off high milk volumes. And then we, we also know that milk and starter intake are really individually variable. So different calves have different intake. And we see this particularly as we increase milk allowance. And I think there's been some interesting work in recent years showing how it can be beneficial to wean calves based on individual starter intake rather than age, which kind of just accommodates how those individuals are different. So this is approach, an approach that we can uh, achieve through the use of technology. So automated milk and starter feeders, which monitor individual intake, give us this way of accommodating needs of individual calves rather than trying to manage based on the needs of the average calf. So I'm interested in, in looking at hay, and we, we know that consuming starter is critical for human development in the pre weaning period, but there's also been interest in providing hay in addition to starter. There's some variability in results here from different groups, um, and I think you know, we know that the effects of hay provision can depend on the type of hay, the type of starter, um, in addition probably to milk feeding program. But there's potential for hay provision to increase total solid feed intake, um, improve the ruminant environment, and then also reduce nutritive oral behavior. So here's an example of some data from a trial where we looked at group housed calves where we saw that access to hay increased total solid feed intake. Starter intake in this trial didn't differ significantly, but uh, those calves provided hay were consuming more solid feed overall, particularly as they got closer to weaning. One thing we see pretty consistently when we offer hay is that um, starter intake increases between weeks more than hay intake. So in this trial, we saw that calves offered starter and hay were consuming hay at about 20% of their total solid feed intake early in the milk feeding period, but then decreased hay selection so that they were consuming hay at a rate of closer to 10% of their dry matter intake as they approached weaning. So kind of adjusting the ratio of hay compared to starter that they're eating. Um, and in this trial, we also saw that the provision of, uh, provision of hay uh, improved weight gain through weaning. We also see that providing hay affects feeding time. So in this graph, we're looking at the feeding time per hour over the course of a 12 hour observation period uh, during the day. So calves had similar feeding time at the time of feed delivery, but then for nearly every hour afterwards, calves provided hay spent more time eating. So this kind of gets at the, the poll question I asked at the beginning about what we think calves spend their time doing. 
And again, it depends, but obviously when calves have hay, they're spending more time eating solid feed than they would otherwise. So I think we see that calves really seem to want to eat hay. And I think we could think about how um, time spent eating hay might have to do with this need to chew and explore or exercise varied foraging behavior as much as anything to do with nutrition. And these opportunities um, or the stimulation provided by hay might have some broader effects on, on behavior. So I wanna spend a little bit more time talking about these non-nutritive oral behaviors in calves. This is something we've been observing and measuring more and more in my lab on some different trials with some interesting results. So I've already shown the duration of teeth-directed unrewarded sucking in restricted fed calves. And I, I think it's pretty well understood that calves might suck on a teat for a while, especially when they're hungry. But uh, we've been interested to see that calves spend a lot of time sucking elsewhere, like on pen bars or buckets, you know, just licking, sucking, and chewing behavior. And these behaviors might be a little bit concerning because if we think about other abnormal oral behavior in livestock and other species, they um, might reflect that some need is not being met for the animal. Um, so we can think about what affects the performance of these behaviors. So we see milk feeding level and method both affect them. And I'll give some data looking at hay provision um, in some other uh, examples in a couple of slides. So we have seen pretty consistently that forage provision does reduce non nutritive oral behavior. I'm showing data from two different trials here. On the left, this was an experiment where calves are housed individually and we provided milk um, at a rate of six liters per day, divided between two feedings. So in this trial on the left, we gave some calves hay, which is shown with the color green, and we also manipulated milk feeding method. So calves were either bucket fed which is shown in the bars with diagonal stripes, or fed milk from a tea bucket, which is shown in the solid bars. On the right, this was a trial with group house calves provided a little bit more milk um, at a rate of eight liters per day, this time by an auto feeder. And in this trial, we just manipulated access to hay, so the pens provided hay are shown in green. So for both trials here, we looked at the duration of pen-directed sucking, um, measured uh, different time points for the milk feeding period. For both of these data sets, we can see that the duration of pen-directed sucking increased over time, um, particularly during weaning in the data on the right. And we saw that providing hay or milk by a teat uh, both reduced this increase in um, pen-directed sucking, um, particularly in later weeks of the milk feeding period. So both provision of hay and provision of a teat are reducing the amount of time calves spend performing that non nutritive oral behavior. So in addition to the, these major topics of feeding and social housing, I wanted to briefly discuss how other resources in the environment can provide some opportunity for behavioral expression and, and what else matters. And something that we've been looking at in the last couple of years in my lab is opportunities for grooming and brush use. So here's an example of the snapshot of what one calf was up to um, during one evening of a trial. So this is a one hour period of observation from 4.20 to 5.20 p.m where we're looking at use of a brush, a rotating brush in this case, uh, shown in yellow, time spent so, uh, social grooming, is shown in blue, and the time spent self-grooming. So we can see here that this calf was occupied for nearly this entire hour with some type of grooming behavior. So they were maybe switching between social grooming and self-grooming, and then you know, brush use and, and self-grooming. This is the period, obviously, where this calf was active, but this is somewhat representative. Most of the calves in the trial were doing this for some period of time during the day. So this is interesting to us. You know, we don't spend a lot of time maybe thinking about how grooming is really important in the context of everything else we have to worry about with calves, but I think it's important to understand this kind of behavior because they clearly occupy a certain amount of time. And we have seen some benefits to encouraging more grooming through brush provision. So we've actually seen that calves with access to a brush um, spend more time self-grooming. So it's like access to the brush sort of stimulates self-grooming. And we've also seen improved coat, uh, coat cleanliness in those calves. I also wanted to show this data here as an example of individual variability in brush use. This is just the duration of using a rotating brush during a 12 hour observation period. This is from eight calves who were each observed for five days. And I, I think it's, um, it's interesting to see how variable the calves are. So they vary between each other, they vary over time. Um, so 
in this, if you look at this individual level data and realize that opportunity to have to use the brush brush access is probably you know affecting calves differently so it's really important for some calves maybe less important for other calves so sometimes when you look at um, outcomes at the group level we, we lose a kind of information overall here we saw that calves use the rotating brush for about 20 to 30 minutes for this 12-hour observation period during the day So in addition to those rotating brushes, we've also looked at sort of an easier alternative. Um, we've looked at use of just manual brushes. Um, this was an example where we just used simple scrub brushes attached to the side of an individual calf pen. So obviously a cheap thing to provide. And we did see that calves use these brushes, um, although not for quite as long as the rotating brush. They use them for about five to 10 minutes per 12 hour observation period. And we can see here in this graph that um, brush use kind of increased around the time is coinciding with milk delivery or just before milk delivery. So feeding time tends to be um, when calves are most active. So that's when they're often standing around and um, feeding and that's when they also seem to use the brush most. So we have also looked at brush use in relation to non nutritive oral behavior with some interesting results. So this graph is showing the duration of time spent performing non nutritive oral behaviors per hour over this 12 hour observation period. For calves that had no brush provided, uh, shown in orange, or calves that had that stationary brush attached to their pen, shown in blue. And we looked at a bunch of different like, types of non of oral behavior in this trial, but really the majority of it was pen-directed sucking. Calves spent most time just sucking on pen fixtures. So one of the first, first things to note here is that um, these non of oral behaviors, again, occurred particularly around time of milk delivery or just before. And at these time points, we saw that calves with a brush spent less time performing the, that pen-directed sucking. So this maybe suggests that an opportunity to perform grooming behavior or maybe just having something else to do when they're active after eating might reduce some boredom or frustration that could lead to non of oral behavior. We also saw that calves with a brush lay down more quickly after feeding. So I'll add dashed lines showing standing time. And the dashed um, blue line shows standing time of calves provided a brush. Um, and we can see that it just dips down a little faster around milk feeding time. So those calves just lay down a little bit more quickly. So they were more likely to lie down and rest. Um, they spent a little time using the brush and then they spent less time performing non oral behavior. Another thing to note from this graph is just how much time overall calves spend performing um, any of these non-nutritive oral behaviors. This adds up to about 40 to 60 minutes per 12-hour observation period. So it's more time than they spend eating in this trial. It's more time than they spent doing just about anything else when they were active. So I, I think this highlights the importance of giving calves things to do during those times of day when they are up and active. They really seem to need a lot of stimulation during those short periods of time. So I'll come back to my question at the beginning of why it matters if we manage calves in a way that allows for them to do more, for more varied behavior. So first, I, I think it's important to think about when we provide calves with more of these opportunities for different behavior, like expressing more feeding behavior or more social interaction or grooming, we're letting them do things that they have demonstrated as important in various settings. And when we accommodate those behaviors, we often see broader benefits. So we see improvements in weight gain coinciding with increased milk allowance or forage provision or social contact. So I think this just kind of suggests that these behaviors are important for a reason. Um, and letting calves do them likely satisfies this need and has broader benefits. So also, when we give calves more to do, we're accommodating some changing preferences and just individual differences in what calves might want or need. And I've given some examples of how calves can be really variable. So this, this matters for a few reasons. And one, just providing choices and allowing for individual differences, I think, is, is positive for animal welfare in itself. But then also, when calves have more to do, um, and, and the more we maybe understand about individual differences and changes in behavior over time, the more that's useful to us, and the more we can use those behavioral indicators to tell us something about the calf. So for example, I discussed the data where we saw 
increased use of a shelter for group housed calves that were disbudded, which might suggest that changes in pen use or changes in social behavior could reflect um, that experience of pain. And I'll give another example um, on this point specific to changes in behavior when calves are sick. So there's a lot of interest in being able to use changes in behavior as an indicator of disease. So we see changes in activity and aspects of feeding behavior that might be detected using automated milk feeders to help us um, you know, flag those calves that are getting sick. But a lot of these indicators of disease are really only evident when milk allowance is higher and feeding behavior is more flexible. We have also seen some changes in behavior in group housed calves, including um, reduced social interaction when they're sick. Um, so this suggests that opportunities for social behavior could maybe give us some more indicators of disease. Here's an example of um, some data where we just saw a reduced frequency of social rest in calves that were challenged with a respiratory disease pathogen. So those calves are shown in orange, and particularly on the day of challenge when they were feeling the most sick, they spent less time resting near other calves. So the point here is that maybe some potential behavioral indicators of calf health, calf health are dependent on what we give the calf, so social contact and feeding level, and by giving calves more to do, we're just giving ourselves more clues to know how our calves are feeling. So finally, I just wanted to talk more generally for a few minutes about why early life experience matters for longer term behavior and welfare. So we know that some of these early management factors can affect some specific aspects of, of behavior in calves, like feeding and social behaviors. Um, but we also know that early experience can affect um, cognition or learning ability. And for example, there's, there's work from the University of British Columbia suggesting that social contact improves calf learning ability, and specifically ability to relearn a task or reversal learning ability. And I'll give some examples of work in my lab looking at some effects of feeding management on cognition as well. Uh, I did want to note though that this work with calves is a tiny fraction of research in this area. It's been well demonstrated across species that um, environmental enrichment or uh, resources that make the environment more complex affect behavioral development um, and development of abnormal behaviors. So for example, in rodents, environmental enrichment um, or providing more for them to do in their cages in the critical period after birth has long-term effects on brain development. So in, in my lab to assess learning ability, we adapted a learning task using a T maze. So this is just a test arena shaped kind of like a T with two arms as shown in this picture. So in this test, we place a reward. So in this case, it was milk fed via a T in one arm of the maze. And the first task is just that the calf needs to learn which side the milk is on. So the calf is tested over um, repeated sessions. So we put a releaser into the, the testing area and then she passes if she goes directly to the right side of the maze, so the correct side that has the milk reward. And then we require that she does it three times in a row to fully pass that stage of learning. And the next test, if she passes that, is reversal learning, where we just switch the side of the reward. So the task is the same, but the calf now has to learn to go directly to the new reward side. So she has to relearn this. And this is the stage of learning that we're really interested in. Um, and this ability to relearn a task or this um, reversal learning is consistently where we see effects of early life experience. Um, and for example, deficits in animals reared in, in more restrictive early environments. So I'll show this example of a video clip where um, this is showing one of the first sessions during the reversal learning stage. So for this calf, during the previous initial learning stage, she already learned the milk bottle was on the right hand side is as we look at the screen, so where the orange label is. But now during reversal learning, the milk bottle has been switched to the opposite arm of the maze where the blue label is. So we're gonna see her make a really common error. So she goes directly to where the milk bottle used to be. She just hasn't quite relearned this. So she'll go over and find it in just a moment, but the calf has failed this session. So she'll be tested again until she eventually meets that learning criteria of going directly to the new correct arm of the maze. So one aspect of early management that we think, you know, we've been interested to, to see it affect this reversal learning task is um, hay provision. So this is something we've seen in different ways in two trials. And this is just some preliminary data showing individually housed calves and how they performed in this reversal learning task. So in this graph, we're looking at the percentage of calves that passed the reversal learning task by session of testing. 
So recalling that they had to get it right, they had to get it right three times in a row to pass. So um, for these calves um, here, they received starter only. And we can see that during the first 10 sessions of the reversal learning task, so the first 10 times they went into that test arena after the location of the milk reward had been moved, they were failing, just like the calf in the video. Um, but then they started to figure it out and they started to go directly to the arm where the milk was now located. So in comparison, we have seen that calves provided hay are better at this. They pass, uh, they, they relearn the task uh, more quickly, they pass more sessions overall, um, particularly earlier during testing. So I think this is interesting and then we can really only speculate on the mechanism here at this point. Um, it could be that maybe there's some general benefit of exposing calves to more different types of feed. Um, it could be some specific sensory aspect of hay or the experience of chewing and consuming hay. We don't really know. But I think we can take away this understanding that relatively simple changes in how we manage calves can affect them um, in ways beyond what we might expect. And that might be important for welfare. So I think this is interesting. I think learning ability at calves is, is important to understand, but does it matter? So we can think about why learning ability or why supporting cognitive development actually matters at all for calves. And I think one thing to consider is we know that as calves develop, um, they experience events that require them to learn new things and cope with change. So they're going to be regrouped. They're going to experience changes in housing and diet. They'll be introduced to the milking parlor. And this reversal learning ability that we're measuring is an indicator of behavioral flexibility. So this means that we're assessing how animals are able to adjust their behavior to match a changing external cue. And this may be predictive um, of their ability to relearn habits and adapt to changing management. So as a simple example, we've seen that calves that performed better in this reversal learning task that adapted more easily in some ways to a novel environment initially after weaning, this was a study where we had individually housed calves that we tested in the reversal loading task that I've already described during the pre-weaning period. Then after weaning, these calves were moved out onto pasture. So at this point they had um, social contact in a novel social group, they had much more space. And um, we released calves in this pasture at the back of the pasture pen. And this was the area shown in blue in this little drawing. And we looked at how much time the calves spent exploring different regions of the pen and how long it took them to begin eating from the feed bunk uh, in the front section of the pasture, which was the, this is the area shown in orange. So we analyzed how cognitive ability during the pre-weaning period, or specifically this ability to relearn that task, was associated with their behavior after grouping. So first, we found that calves that had been able to pass the reversal learning task spent relatively little time at the back of the pen and they spent much more time up at the front eating. In contrast, calves that had failed the reversal learning task spent more time at the back of the pasture, they were slower to explore, and they took longer to begin eating. And actually, two of the calves in this group um, didn't begin eating until the next day after grouping. So we can see this importance of learning ability, um, and, and this trial really varied between individuals. So we want to support calves' ability to adapt to a novel environment throughout their life. So this learning ability may depend on early management factors during the pre-mating period. So to wrap up, um, we can improve calf welfare and performance, I think, by giving them more to do. So social contact has broad benefits for behavioral development and calf performance. And we can also improve social housing by reducing competition and maybe even accommodating varying social preferences. As far as feeding, we see that providing calves with more milk reduces hunger and accommodates natural feeding behavior and has lasting performance benefits if calves are weaned gradually. We also see that calves want to consume hay and providing hay has um, both behavioral and performance benefits. And then we, we just see that giving calves more to do, including providing a brush, reduces non oral behavior and so might be generally beneficial. Also, um, increased opportunity for behavioral expression accommodates individual differences. And so this can provide an indication of how the calf is feeling. And finally, early life uh, management and environmental complexity has long-term welfare benefits affecting behavioral and cognitive development and likely improving the ability of the calf to cope with management changes throughout their life. 
So thank you very much again for this opportunity to present this webinar and thank you to everyone listening in. I'd like to acknowledge the funding support from my lab and thank some of my graduate students past and present who really did a bunch of the hard work here. So I think we have some time for questions. Um, thank you very much. Very good, Emily. Thank you so much for that presentation. And I think we can all agree how important it is to get these calves off to a good start. <coughs> Excuse me. I would also like to thank Agroplastics for their support of this program. And um, we really appreciate the, um, them helping us support and provide these educational opportunities. To view this webinar again, or any of our previous webinars, you can visit our archives at any time at www.hordes.com slash webinars. You can find all of our webinars from the last 10 years at that tab. Um, if you will go to the next slide, um, I'd like to invite you to our upcoming webinars. Um, on August 10th, we will be having a presentation by Jim Salfer from the University of Minnesota Extension. And he'll be talking about feeding and managing cows in robotic milking systems. And that presentation will be sponsored by De Laval. Um, in September, we'll have a presentation on calcium and the transition cow by Dr. Gary Etzel from the University of Wisconsin School of Veterinary Medicine. So again, we have these monthly webinars, always the second Monday of the month, and these are our next two presentations. And we hope that you'll mark your calendar, and make plans to attend one of these or both of them um, and join our group again. So we had some questions that came in before the webinar. Um, so Mike, I'll have you go through those and Emily will look forward to your responses. Well, here we go. And uh, these came in, as you can see, this is from Egypt. When should we start feeding forages to calves? And you may be already inkled on that one already. And are there any guidelines for feeding legume versus grass uh, hay or forage to younger animals? Yes, so good questions. Um, I, I always hesitate to say there are specific guidelines because I'm not sure there are any I would trust without necessarily seeing how a lot of this works in the context of specific farms. And I, I did discuss forage feeding quite a bit without um, making any real recommendations. Um, so maybe first I'll just say that another really quest common question is just how much hay calves should get. But I think it's important to um, think about how calves want to eat different amounts of hay at different times. So um, we see that hay selection changes relative to start over time, which makes it hard to make any sort of fixed recommendations. And we also expect that the addition of hay is going to interact with other aspects of the feeding program. Like, so the answer to this question might depend on the starter ration or milk allowance. But I mean, first about when to start offering forage, I think that there's no reason not to start offering it early if they're gonna be offered it. I mean, around the time that starter is introduced or maybe no later than two or three weeks of age, um, and I say this just because we see them eating it that early, and we have seen some effects of it reducing pen directed sucking that early, so it suggests that it could be beneficial at that age. Um, but there, to, to my knowledge, there has not been a lot of research specifically looking at the timing of providing forage, so this is a little bit of speculation. Um, as far as what forage to provide, we do know that calves will eat more of some kinds of forage than others. Um, they might be eating more alfalfa than grass hay. Um, so this is sometimes um, a concern where if we think we're going to provide a really palatable forage or a forage that they're going to consume more of, it might um, decrease starter intake, which has been seen occasionally. Um, but I mean, there's, there's also a, a meta-analysis published a couple of years ago actually suggesting that alfalfa hay stimulated more starter intake. So I think it's just not completely clear. And I would say that a lot of this work looking at effects of hay provision has not been um, extensively replicated in different settings, so with calves in different milk allowances or calves with different starter rations or social housing. And so I wouldn't necessarily leap to conclusions about the effects of forage variety. I would say that the hay we give calves doesn't need to be high quality. So I would maybe just recommend offer calves whatever you hay you have. They're probably going to eat it and they're already getting the energy they need from starter. So it doesn't need to be really, really high quality. Um, but I would recommend chopping it because calves have an easier time picking up and eating chopped hay. And I guess the bottom line for all of this is just, I think um, calves seem to like hay, but no matter what you do, it's a good idea to keep an eye on how they're doing like we would with any change in diet or management. So start offering hay and then just keep an eye on starter intake and, and weight gain. Oh, 
Okay, our second question, and we're kind of in the speed round now, so we're going to go quick on these questions. What causes weaned calves and older heifers to suckle on the udders of their pen mates? And that comes from New York. Okay, good question. I'll try to answer it more quickly. Um, so yeah, I think this ties in probably to what I discussed with non of oral behavior in young calves. So certainly some of the same risk factors apply because there is evidence that this um, cross-sucking or intersucking beyond weaning can be a continuation of that habit learned early in life. So um, particularly the things, uh, the things I discussed that reduce pen-directed sucking also apply to cross-sucking. And I would also say that I think it's particularly important that we wean animals really gradually. So we step down milk really gradually since this is probably the time period that might be most likely to influence the continuation of behavior after that milk feeding period. Our last send-in question comes from Italy, and can you address the subject of heat stress in newborn dairy calves and young heifers? Yeah, so um, feels like a very timely question from my perspective in Florida. Um, I haven't done a lot of work in this area. Uh, some of this work is, is being done at the University of Florida by my colleague, Kimena Laporta, but I have worked with her specifically to look at how heat stress affects calf behavior. So we do see um, changes in physiological responses and behavior responses with increasing uh, temperature humidity index, um, but some of those um, uh, responses are reduced through cooling calves. Uh, other interesting work related to this has actually also looked at effects of you know, prenatal or in utero heat stress, so heat stress of the cow while she's pregnant and how she affect, that affects the calf. Prenatal heat stress reduces birth weight and has also some carryover effects on activity and feed intake of the calves. So both of these I think are important to consider. Um, but certainly as it gets hot um, to um, think about how to cool calves using fans and shade so that we're not seeing the same negative effects on growth and feed intake. And I think we could also think about when we feed calves when it's hot out. Um, we know that when it's hot, they want to consume less milk, but offering milk in times of day when it's cooler out um, and calves are more motivated to drink could help. We might also think about offering milk in more frequent smaller meals, I think, to my two cents. Okay, we have a lot of questions and I'll put them up here. What type of hay did you use in the study? Did you pre-process that hay and did you mix it with the calf starter? I think you kept it separately the way I understood. Comments? Yeah, so we used um, mostly grass hays, different varieties in different years. Um, we did not mix it with the starter and we used a pelleted starter. So not a texturized starter. I have done trials where we mixed them and we would sometimes see that calves would sort in favor of hay. So mixing a starter and hay together is not necessarily going to make a huge difference in terms of what calves are eating. Um, but yes, grass hay we chose. Okay, um, was uh, the hay fed calves always bedded on sand or sawdust? They were bedded on sand, and um, which is just a standard practice at our dairy. Um, I think if you're bedding calves on pretty much anything you bed calves on, I think they might be likely to eat, um, certainly straw, bedding. Um, I've seen calves eat sawdust and we actually sometimes have problems with calves eating sand. Uh, but yes, in, in these trials, they were bedded on sand. It goes back to the, the hay question. Did you any growth monitoring on those calves that are eating 20% hay uh, early in, in the weaning area? Could you repeat that? Was, did you say growth monitoring? Growth, 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 uh, body weight growth, stature, uh, when those calves that ate more hay, especially uh, in the early phase of weaning. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we, we did see effects of hay intake um, where they had improved waking through weaning. We don't, didn't consistently see much of a difference in growth during the pre-weaning period, but more consistently, at least later in the pre-weaning period or through weaning, that access to hay improved weight gain. A related question comes uh, from another country. It says, what should the NDF level in a calf starter diet be from one month to three months of age and then from three to six months of age for the heifer? I think um, in the interest of our speed round, I have to defer to a nutritionist on that one. Inter inter interesting. Uh, I, I, the only comment I would add to it, at three to six months of age, the high group TMR fits really, really well. So I, I think if you look at kind of what the high group TMR, typically in that 30% NDF number fits really well. In fact, some farmers actually do that, put these yeah, heifers at four to six months of age in the high group TMR as far as that goes. Uh, are there any, um, uh, is there any papers that address the effect of grouping calves after weaning or keeping them individual stalls for a couple of days after weaning? Yeah, it's a good question. So if they're not going to be housed in groups during the pre-weaning period, um, 
I would say that sort of separating those stressors is probably a good idea. If they aren't already grouped before weaning, grouping them right at weaning, I think could be a problem for the development of cross-sucking. So waiting a couple of days until they're a few days past weaning before you're grouping them is probably better than trying to combine those events. Kind of an interesting question comes from the UK, and that is that they have some farmers now that are keeping the cow and the calf together for a period of time. What's your opinion on that, especially when we see pressure coming from consumer groups relating to the kind of human aspects in hospitals? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it's really important. And I think there's a little bit of resistance. I see um, people don't necessarily want to do that research, but I think we need to because we don't want to be in a position of having this um, sort of the public perception driving change without us knowing how to make the change in a way that'll be successful. So I think it's something that we need to be thinking more about and doing more research. Wow, kind of an interesting question. Calf reared in a group with automated calf feeders, do they adapt better to robotic milkers when they become adult cows? I think that's a great question. I'm not sure that we know the answer. I'd like to say maybe, um, but uh, I, think, I think we need to do some more long-term work to know the answer for sure. I think it goes back to one of your PowerPoints comes from Turkey and they said, what is the correct time for weaning? Uh, what are your checkpoints uh, to, to when you should do it when you looked at the, the timeline there? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it depends on a lot of things. There's not necessarily a single age that's going to work. Um, certainly later is better uh, in terms of uh, weaning calves in a way that's going to maintain more consistent weight gain. They're consuming more starter the older they get. Um, you know, I, I hesitate to make any real recommendation based on age because I really like the work that's looking at this from sort of the individual level. Some calves will wean early, no problem, and some calves just need a lot longer on milk. So certainly later, if, it, if the six versus eight was the example of the, the study that I showed, eight weeks was better. You may want to consider this one uh, with the current situation on reducing milk in the U.S. What about weaning calves at 12 weeks of age? In other words, we got to get rid of this surplus milk or this uh, baseline milk. Any, any thoughts on extending the, the weaning period much later to utilize this milk uh, since we are limited on what we can sell? Yeah, I mean, I think that the longer we keep calves on milk, the better it is for them. So I, I don't see any reason why that isn't a good idea. I mean, we know biologically, um, calf would be consuming milk for a lot longer than how we you know, manage them conventionally on farm. Do pair reared calves express more suckling between them? Uh, and does the ad libitum supply affect this behavior? So do pair suck, I mean, more cross sucking, certainly cross sucking is a possibility whenever calves are housed in groups. Um, if that's what the question is, um, and provision of more milk, um, opportunity, um, like provision of the teat for a period of time outside of just the window of milk delivery provides an outlet for that kind of behavior. And then any of the other factors I talked about, I, I talked about you know, individual non restrictive oral behaviors a certain amount, but the same things apply to cross-sucking. We just typically see less cross-sucking than say some of that pen-directed sucking, if that hopefully answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. Uh, you mentioned paired. Have you ever looked at three calves versus two? And what if you switch the pair uh, halfway through the study? Does it make a difference if you bring a new calf into the pair at weeks two, weeks four, week six? So I haven't personally looked at uh, groups of three, but we looked at groups of four. Um, so you know, certainly some of the same things we see in pairs, we see in small groups. Pairs are just kind of a an easy way to provide that benefit of social contact without dramatically changing other aspects of management. As far as changing the companion, like any sort of social regroup, regrouping can be disruptive and stressful. We know that calves develop bonds with familiar calves. They spend more time near the animals that are familiar to them. So I would say it would not be a good idea to switch out the pair of the calf unless there was no alternative. I think replacing the pair, if say the pair died, is better than not replacing it, but I wouldn't try to have that be part of standard management. Is there a better growth on calves that have accesses to brushes and balls and other objects in the pen? Have you looked at uh, the performance of those calves or those objects? Yeah, that's a good question. In our trials, we haven't seen an effect of brush access on weight gain. We were interested in that. Um, we looked at feed intake and weight gain and some other performance outcomes. Um, we did see an improvement in coat cleanliness, which we thought was positive and maybe could translate to some health benefits, um, but we didn't see any differences in weight gain. So, I mean, we see other benefits of providing the calves with those things to do with brush access, um, but we haven't seen any effect on weight gain. 
Uh, last question. Have you any detailed health comparison data between individual and group housing calves, the uh, scouring, respiratory diseases, things like that? Um, not personally, but but there's certainly other good data out there describing it, including the combinations of different data sets discussing it. And I think particularly when milk intake is, is not restrictive, there's there's not much evidence to suggest that group housing, if done properly, affects health outcomes. Um, there's There's been some nice um, review papers on that in the last couple of years. Um, we are starting some longer term research where we plan to track um, individual and socially housed animals beyond the pre-weaning period and, and into lactation and, and collect some longer term health data on that. Um, so we'll, we'll have some data from my lab coming up eventually, but nothing at the moment. And I promise this is the last question. Have you monitored water intake on some of your studies? Do you see anything difference between milk with starter and uh, with hay and, and, and milk itself? That's a really good question. I think it's really important. We have not been measuring water intake mostly just because it's difficult with um, you know, getting the farm and collecting the data. So it's a little bit hard to manage, but um, I think we should be. Um, and I think it's important that we think about it. Well, Abby, we'll turn it back to you to wrap up. Thank you, Mike, and thank you to Dr. Miller Cushion for this great presentation with some of their current research in calf raising and then answering this great group of large group of questions. Um, we're fortunate to have a very um, big group online and a very active group. So thank you all for your participation. Um, once again, I would also like to thank Agroplastics for their support of our webinar program. If we go ahead one slide, I'll just remind you one more time of our upcoming webinars. In August, on the 10th, we'll be talking about feeding and managing cows in robotic milking systems. And then in September, on the 14th, we will talk about calcium and transition cows. And then that will, presentation will be given by Dr. Gary Etzel. So please make plans to attend. And we did have someone that asked where they could get the recording of this um, today's webinar. And all of our webinars are archived on our website, www.hordes.com. Um, this particular presentation will be up in the next couple of days, so you can find it there at that time. So once again, thank you all for joining us today and listening. We hope you will hop on board for a future webinar. And until then, I'd like to say goodbye and stay healthy to all of you out there from all of us here at Hordes Steerman and our team at the University of Illinois. Take care.